Welcome back, Mitochondriax, for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. We have finally finished the vitamin D micro series, and we're going to be moving on to the next very important biomolecule to combat age related diseases, mitochondrial dysfunction, and of course, cancer. And that biomolecule is called melatonin. And I want you to try to, for a brief amount of time, put aside what you think you know about melatonin. I think that even up until a couple of years ago, I thought I had some idea of what melatonin is and what it does and how it is to be used in a clinical fashion. Most people associate melatonin with the feeling of tiredness and as a way to help you go to sleep. And I'm going to make the case over the next coming videos that pretty much everything about that is false. And you're going to have hopefully the same reverence that you have hopefully after the vitamin D series for melatonin and consider it highly for not only disease prevention, but for disease reversal. And we're going to see in the later parts of these series, similar to vitamin D, it has profound anti-cancer and anti-Warburg effects, which I look forward to getting to in the coming few days and weeks. So I want to start out with this paper. It's called, Is Melatonin the Next Vitamin D? A Review of Emerging Science, Clinical Uses, Safety, and Dietary Supplements. And it says here that melatonin has become a popular dietary supplement known as a chronobiotic and for establishing healthy sleep. Research over the last decade into cancer, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, fertility, PCOS, and many other conditions combined with the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a greater awareness of melatonin because of its ability to act as a potent antioxidant, immune active agent, and mitochondrial regulator. There are distinct similarities between melatonin and vitamin D and the depth and breadth of their impact on health. Both act as hormones, affect multiple systems throughout their immune modulating anti-inflammatory functions, are found in the skin, and we're going to find out that it's actually everywhere in the body, not just the skin, and are responsive to sunlight and darkness. In fact, there may be similarities between the widespread concern of vitamin D deficiency as a quote unquote sunlight deficiency, which we've talked about several times in this channel. It's more than just vitamin D. It's this, this entire sunlight deficiency and reduce melatonin secretion as a result of a darkness deficiency from overexposure to artificial blue light. We're going to talk a lot about artificial blue light when it comes to circadian biology and mitochondrial dysfunction and how it affects that. But we're going to have to touch a little bit on the circadian aspects of it because melatonin is a circadian hormone at the end of the day. So some of you may be facile or have an understanding of how our bodies know when to release certain hormones. And I think the most classical hormone that fits the circadian release pattern is cortisol. And cortisol is based off of light cycles as well. And if I could have a graph to show you, what you would see is when, when cortisol is dropping throughout the day, and then raising and dropping, melatonin, pineal melatonin, should be the exact opposite release pattern. You'll see it go up during the night and then come down during the day, up at night. And this is based off of light and not just any light. So this is a micro graph of the visible light spectrum from 400 nanometers in the violet all the way up to 700 nanometers in the red spectrum. And right here in the middle, blue spectrum, about 465 nanometers is the maximally activating light spectrum for a receptor in the back of our eye, a non-visual photoreceptor, meaning that it receives light, but it is not about transmitting a visual image to the brain. It is transmitting just its presence or absence. And when 465 nanometer light, and realistically it is not exactly 465, that's just where the maximum impact is at, but between let's say 380 and about 550 nanometers, which is into the violet and up into the green spectrum, it's going to activate melanopsin. And when melanopsin is activated in a circadian fashion, it's going to tell the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a master clock regulator in the brain, that it is daytime. And when melanopsin is not activated, when it is dark outside, or there's a lack of these spectrums of light, it's going to tell the brain that it's dark and it's time to start releasing pineal melatonin into circulation. So what it says here is 
visible light synchronizes the human biological clock in the suprachiasmatic nuclei of the hypothalamus to the 24-hour cycle. Short wavelengths, in this case, violet, blue, and to some degree green, perceived as blue color, are the strongest synchronizing agent for the circadian system that keeps most biological and psychological rhythms internally synchronized. Pretty cool. So let's get a little bit deeper into light cycles here. Essentially, most of us know that the color temperature of the sun is different at different parts of the day. Most of us realize that, you know, early at dawn, when the sun is coming up, we can pretty much look at or near where the sun is at, and it's not going to necessarily hurt our eyes. And it's because the color temperature is different and the spectrum of light is different. And you're going to see that depending on the latitude and the time of year, there'll be very little violet and ultraviolet at that time of day, unless you're near the equator. You'll have some blue because we want to simulate melanopsin to show that it's daytime outside. But this blue is always balanced by red. And if you remember from prior talks, no matter what time of day it is, no matter what time of year it is, no matter what latitude, the sun is about 50% infrared. So there's always a balance between blue spectrums and red and infrared spectrums. And the body knows that. And the body is able to tell the time of day depending on that. And as you can see, UV as the day goes on is going to get higher. Again, again time of the year and the, the latitude. Blue is going to continue to go up, always balanced by red. And then ultimately at dusk, the color temperature changes. It's a more orange hue. And the UV and the blue are going to completely collapse. And you're still going to be left with that yellow, orange, red, and infrared in the sky. And that is signaling to your retina that it is nighttime. And what happens is, is that this suprachiasmatic nucleus starts to pump out signals to tell the pineal gland to start releasing melatonin. And that's exactly what happens when they test serum levels of melatonin. You see that in the morning it's coming down. And then during the day, right around, you know, five, six o'clock in the afternoon, when the sun's, depending on the time of year, of course, and the latitude, but when the sun's starting to come down, that's when melatonin starts to come up. And then when, when darkness hits, you can see this darkness starts here, right here at let's say 2100 or 2200, then we're going to see a giant spike in melatonin. And this is measured in picograms per milliliter, where you have, you know, your largest spike around two o'clock in the morning, and then it'll start to fall as cortisol rises, if you remember back on this graph. So this is how the circadian rhythm works. It's based off of light cycles, primarily, first and foremost. And so when we're exposed, like it said in this paper, it says that reduced melatonin secretion as a result of a darkness deficiency from overexposure to artificial blue light. And we'll talk about more where those artificial blue lights come from and where we're getting the majority of our exposure at in the future. But the bottom line is when we're exposed to blue light at the wrong time of day, we're going to not produce the pineal circadian melatonin secretion, and that's going to affect our health negatively. And I'll end on this melatonin's role in cancer effect on clock genes. The circadian clock is a regulatory system with a periodicity of approximately 24 hours that generates rhythmic changes in many physiologic processes. Increasing evidence links chronodisruption with aberrant functionality of clock gene expression, resulting in multiple diseases, including cancer. In this context, tumor cells have an altered circadian machinery compared to normal cells, which dysregulates the cell cycle, how the cell decides to grow and or not grow. It also deregulates repair mechanisms, energy metabolism, sounds like the Warburg effect, and other processes. Melatonin is the main hormone produced by the pineal gland, whose production and secretion oscillates in accordance to the light-dark cycle. In addition, melatonin regulates the expression of clock genes, including those in cancer cells, which could play a role in numerous oncostatic effects of this hormone. Oncostatic would mean anti-cancer effects or stopping the cancer dead in its tracks. So as you can see in this very short video today, we're going to be laying down many of the important aspects of melatonin. We probably can't cover it all, even in a micro series, just like we couldn't cover it all in the vitamin D series. But I'm going to make the case very strong that melatonin is your friend. You need to be thinking about melatonin when it comes to mitochondrial health, when it comes to general health, and when it comes to cancer, both prevention and treatment. I hope you like this video. I look forward to making some more outside, but it's just not a nice day today. It's raining. It's cloudy. It's kind of nasty. And I'm here under the sky portal from chroma lights. Hopefully the next video I can make it outside, but it is what it is. I just want to say that I really appreciate the comments that we've been getting. It's really been fun to interact with you guys on a day-to-day -day basis and answer some of your questions. I just want to end with this. I've had a couple of cases this week that's been pretty tough. And one of them 
was a uh, 30-year-old female. Um, she was pre-diabetic, had nearly single-digit vitamin D levels, and came in with abdominal pain. You would think 30-year-old female, first of all, shouldn't be in a hospital to begin with, but if they come in with abdominal pain, you would think that it would be something simple, something like constipation, something like a gastroenteritis or viral or bacterial infection. But on her CT scan, it showed a partially obstructing mass and um, ended up having a colonoscopy and was found to have colon cancer, uh, likely metastatic, which means that it had spread past the colon. And um, I was just, I was just shocked that, um, you know, another hyper young person with these horrible diseases. And, um, you know, I wasn't able to spend a ton of time or energy or resources into investigating, but, you know, at minimum, low vitamin D, obese, and pre-diabetic. And that at least is probably a big part of the story. Tying in melatonin to this, I would bet that there are blue light devices being used 24-7, and her melatonin is probably bottomed out. We can't really test it in the hospital, unfortunately. It has to be done as an outpatient, but this is how it starts. These are the factors that start the path down towards dysfunction, disease, and these kind of outcomes. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. So take melatonin very seriously, take vitamin D very seriously, and help prevent these horrible tragedies from happening. Until next time.